Hi everyone! So far we've discussed sequential logic circuit analysis and design and in this class we'll cover registers and counters. Sequential circuits, remember, whether they have combinational logic internal to their design or not, they are still called sequential due to storage elements in them which create states. In this class, we'll see more popular sequential circuits, as I said, like registers and counters. A register is a set of flip-flops interconnected with each other and share a common clock capable of storing information bits. A register may include combinational circuits as well for data processing in addition to the flip-flops. The main idea with using flip-flops is to create storage of bits, and the combinational circuits serve the transfer of these stored bits across the registers. A counter, on the other hand, is a special type of register that goes through a predetermined sequence of binary states. There are various types of registers and we'll only cover a subset of those in this class. We can transfer information from one register to another using registers with parallel load. Synchronous digital systems have a continuous train of clock pulses. However, at each pulse, whether on rising edge or falling edge, the flip-flops are excited. Most of the time, we need a separate control signal whenever we want register transfer execution. The transfer of information to another register is called loading in our context. Since all the flip-flops share a common clock, the loading will happen in parallel at the appropriate pulse of the clock. As we have mentioned in the previous class, incorporating gates in the clock path is not healthy advice, as this can lead the system go out of sync easily. Therefore, we use a control input called load. When the load is set to 1, we select the contents of the register A, and hence, at the appropriate pulse of the clock, the register A contents shall be delivered to register B, where the contents of the register A stays unchanged. When the load is zero, meaning that there shall be no transfer operation, the MUX will select the output of the register B as the input to retain its value at each clock pulse. This is done so because unlike other flip-flops, the flip-flops do not have hold state, in other words, the QT in, a, in their state table. Otherwise, we wouldn't need such a feedback in our circuit. Another popular register type is known as shift registers, which is capable of shifting the binary information to its neighboring cell either right or left. The logic diagram of a shift register consists of a cascade of flip-flops with the output of the one flip-flop is connected to the input of the next. All flip-flops are synchronously clocked to achieve shifting operation. Instead of giving you step-by-step -step operation of a shift register, I'd like to show you the functional operation of a shift register through a serial information transfer example as shown in the slide. We still have two registers, register A and register B, both are shift registers, and we transfer information from register A to register B. Register A has a feedback because continuous clock signals will lead the information to shift in the register, and in order to keep the same information in the same register, after the transfer, we need circular shift in, re in register A. And the feedback is doing exactly that, while the content is allowed to transfer to register B at exactly four clock cycles. However, if we shift on more than four clock pulses, register contents will not be right unless it's a multiple of four shifts, and we do not need that many shifts either. To be able to terminate the transferred information, we put an end gate with the clock. This has always been an avoided advice. Um, however, in this example, gating the clock will not cause a single operation because both the clock and the shift control signals incur the same amount of delay. Finally, I'd like to stress that registers usually have enable inputs when deasserted. De the shift operation is disabled. Most operations on hardware are done in parallel, including binary addition operation. Main motivation behind parallel operation is the speed. Serial operations take more clock cycles to complete an execution. However, serial implementations usually require fewer hardware logic, when, which means less silicon area on the chip, so there is a trade-off there. Here is another example to serial operation called serial adder using shift registers. Note that in this picture, the rightmost bit of the bit stream stored in the shift registers are the least significant bit position. Shift control input is connected to the enable input of the shift registers. The serial input fills in the register A during the first eight clock cycles after the control signal turns one. Next eight clock cycles will transfer the content of register A to register B because the initial content of register B was set to zero. While copying the content, the serial input starts filling register A and hence register B will start holding the sum value. At the end of the 16 clock cycles, the first 8 bits of the serial input will be transferred to register B and the second 8 bits will be stored in register A. 
If we allow 80 more clock cycles, register A will get added to register B content and the sum will be stored in register B. This, produce, this procedure can be used to add more 8-bit numbers through the serial input port. Please follow the operations of the full adder at each clock cycle to be able to see the circuit operation. Note that the clock of the circuit is gated with the control signal to generate the clock of the D flip flops to enable the carry out to be stored, only if registers are functional and enabled. If you have noticed in our previous register drawings, there are input and output ports on the top and bottom of the register logic diagram. These input and output ports provide access to the output of each flip-flop inside the register. Therefore, the information entered serially by shifting can be taken out in parallel, or the information can be entered using parallel load into the flip-flop same way and shifted out serially. Therefore, the shift register can be used as a serial to parallel converter. The most general shift register have the following capabilities. A clear control that can set each flip-flop state to zero, a clock signal for synchronization, a shift right control to enable shift right operation and a shift left control to enable shift left operation. A parallel load control to enable parallel transfer, say using 4, bit, uh, four bits parallel input, and output lines as shown in this example. The simplified block diagram for 4 bit universal shift register is shown at the left bottom of the slide, and there are four operations defined that can be selected by two select inputs. The register operation based on the select input combination is shown in a table drawn right bottom of the slide. The internal design of the universal shift register is shown in the book and has not drawn here. Um, but it's important to look at them and understand uh, the internal design. Uh, but it's basically the combination of all the operations we have covered so far. A register that traverses a predefined sequence of states upon the application of clock pulses is known as a counter. If the sequence of states are binary numbers, the counter is called binary counter. For example, an n-bit binary counter contains n flip-flops and can count from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. There are two design approaches to counters. One of them is called ripple counters. The ripple counters are asynchronous counters and a flip-flop transition serves as a source of triggering other flip-flops. On the other hand, the second type called synchronous counters, all flip-flops use the same clock for triggering. Synchronous counters can be designed using the design techniques of our previous lecture, uh, the sequential design, and we will show a few examples of such counters in this class. But you haven't seen the async counters. A binary ripple adder can be realized using complementing flip-flop using either a JK flip-flop by connecting the inputs or a T flip-flop. A design with T flip-flop is shown in this slide. The least significant bit Q0 is complemented with each count pulse of the input labeled as data in. Each time Q0 prime goes from 0 to 1, uh, or in other words Q0 goes from 1 to 0, it complements the Q1. Similarly, each time Q1 prime goes from 0 to 1, it complements Q2 and so on and so forth. Consider, for example, the transition from count uh, 0011 to 0100. In this case, Q0 prime goes from 0 to 1, which complements Q1, and leads to Q1 prime to go from 0 to 1. Finally, Q2 becomes 1, and hence the state 0, 1, 0, 0. Note that we have connected clock inputs of flip-flops to the Q output of the flip-flop of the previous stage. We could get binary count down counter, um, which can count starting from 15 and continues to binary counts of 14, 13 till 0, and back to 15. Same ripple counter can be implemented using D flip-flops, and that practice is left as an exercise. Design of synchronous counters are different in that, unlike ripple counters, they use the same common clock to keep flip-flops in sync through the counting operation. We will show a design of 3-bit counter using T flip-flops using the design procedures of the last lecture. First, we draw the state diagram, and from the state diagram, we generate the state table as shown. Flip-flop inputs can be derived using the excitation table for T flip-flops. From the state table, we can derive the simplified expressions for TA0, TA1, and TA2. And they are given by TA0 being equal unity, TA1 equals A0, and finally TA2 given by A1 ended with A0. These expressions can easily be derived using the techniques for simplifying combinational logic expressions. Next we draw the logic diagram based on the state equations. This is shown on top of the slide. You can replace the logic 1 port with enable port and using an end gate to provide enabling capability. This circuit is shown below. 
when enable equals 1, the counter counts up. When enable is 0, it stops. Lastly, we want to count down using the same circuit. We can achieve that if you connect the input of the input of uh, the AND gate to the complemented output of the flip-flops. In other words, Q0, Q, Qs uh, in that diagram. After understanding how a count up and down sequential uh, logic works, with a little bit of thought, we can use a 2x1 two, two, two uh, mux uh, or multiplexer to select between the up and down counter using the same circuit layout. The circuit with mux is shown in this slide is drawn in logism. I also put a hex display, uh, display uh, item to see how the count up and down process manifests itself. It should not be too hard to generalize the circuit the 4-bit and 8-bit count up and down counters. Please try to draw this yourself in Logism or another appropriate software and toggle the enable clock and select inputs to see how the circuit behaves. You can also add continuous clock signal to create timing diagrams if your software allows that. Use hexadecimal display to debug your circuit and check if it meets the given specifications. Please spend some, some time and walk through uh, each component of the circuit to make sure that you understand how it works. The counters of today's digital systems have something called parallel load capability. This enables the designer to transfer an initial binary number into the counter flip-flops before the actual count operation takes place. Here in this slide, I have drawn a top-level block diagram of such a circuit that has 4-bit input, four input data that can set the counter to initialize counting starting from some predefined binary number. It also has count, clear, and clock inputs, and a carry output. The carry output is useful if you'd like to synthesize bigger counters. The operation of this generalized counter is summarized in the table, shown to the right of the top-level block diagram. As you can see, the clear input, when set to zero, the flip-flops are reset to zero. When clear and load are one at the same time, we'll load the flip-flops with 4-bit input to set the starting binary number of the counter. When load turns zero, the count input is checked. If it is logical one, then the counter is incremented. Otherwise, no change is made to the current state of the counter. This version can be manipulated to make flip-flops negative edge, or we can add countdown capability to the circuit as well. Please refer to your book to know more about the logic diagram of the circuit and think about what to do to do add such features to, to your new counter. It is left as an exercise to design a three-decade BCD counter using this 4-bit binary counter. In digital signals uh, and systems, we need timing signals um, that can span a predefined time frame to enable a particular circuit operation. A ring counter is a, cir a circular shift register with only one flip-flop being set at any particular time. If the output of a shift register is fed back to the input, a ring counter results. A data pattern contained within the shift register will recirculate as long as clock pulses are applied. For example, the data pattern will repeat every four clock pulses in the figure shown. The circular shift is illustrated with the help of the table showing the count sequence. Ring counter is self-decoding, so we do not need to use gates to decode the information. If we feed a 4-input encoder with the flip-flop contents, the output will give us the binary counter. This establishes the relationship between ring counters and binary counters. In other words, to go from ring counter to binary counter, we need encoder. To go from binary counter to ring counter, we need a decoder. This argument means we need additional logic to convert one to another. Timing diagram is shown for the ring counter at the bottom of the slide showing you the clock sequence and four outputs of the counter flip-flops. There are two major pitfalls of a ring counter. First, it needs to be initialized because shifting all zero content does not generate counting effect. Second, it's not resistant to errors. If there happens in, in an unused state in the counter, it's hard to sync it back to valid counting states, making the counter useless. The binary counter with decoding states fixes the error resilience problem. It also uses less number of flip-flops, but more logic gates to achieve the counting operation. All right, so another counter type, which is the last section in this presentation, Johnson counter. The difference between a ring counter and a Johnson counter is, is in which the output of the last stage is fed back. It's, it's either Q or Q prime, depending on which counter we're talking about. Well. Connecting Q prime to the to the input of the, the first flip flop QA, which lead this will gonna lead to count sequence shown to the right of the top level block diagram in a table. So the the period of the sequence is now eight instead of four. 
This is the double the period generated by the ring counter. So Johnson counter does not have initialization problem, as the zeros unit input enables the counter to go through all eight stages. However, decoding is needed to get the correct output. We can use AND gates to decode for appropriate output. AND gates required for the output are given in the rightmost column of the table. Finally, we include the timing diagram of the flip-flop output and decoder waveforms at the bottom of the slide. Note that the top-level block diagram of draw does not include eight AND gates that generate the, the counter output. Uh, so you can put those gates for the decoding part. Johnson counter can still suffer from external noise. It could get into one of the disallowed states. Once get in those states, the counter's behavior could be very, very unpredictable. Uh, therefore, in real-life applications, some form of the logic should be included to fix in case the counter gets into one of those disallowed states. All right, so in this class, we cover two important synchronous sequential logic circuits. One of them is the basic storage element, popularly known as registers. We also seen that registers can be used to count numbers, and they are usually called counters. One of the important topics of today was the register transfer operation, which is quite essential in digital processing units, especially the central processing unit that we will see next. After learning about digital system components, in the next lecture, we'll hopefully start discussions about central processing unit design and a, and a basic computer design and give short introduction to these computer design basics, um, you know, uh, remembering by remembering the uh, fundamental blocks of digital systems. This way, you will hopefully see whether uh, you have learned uh, in this, whatever you learn in this class, and, and they're, all, they're all in action. So please feel free to drop any questions you might have about today's lecture into my mailbox, and I'll be more than happy to help you with your questions. Thanks a lot.